Hello, thank you for joining us for Beyond the Frame, Pushing Boundaries of Photo-Based Work. I am Greg Sandoval of the John Paul Getty Museum Public Programs. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's artist conversation between Mercedes Dorame, Hyung Mi Shin, and Corey Newkirk. This program is being presented in conjunction with the current exhibition, Photo Flux, Unshuttering LA, which is currently on view at the Getty Center through October 10th. You can make reservations to visit the Getty Center using the link in the chat box. I am joining you from my home in Los Angeles on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tonga peoples with honor and respect for the deep history of this region. Before I introduce Jill Moniz, guest curator of PhotoFlux, I wanted to share a couple of program details. To access live captioning, click the CC button icon on your Zoom menu bar at the bottom of your screen. Also feel free to submit questions to our panelists at any time during the conversation using the Q&A function. The exhibition Photo Flux on Shuttering LA was organized by independent curator Jill Moniz and features 35 acclaimed photographers with ties to Los Angeles communities. The primarily Black, Indigenous, and people of color artists in the exhibition have radically transformed photography to express their own aesthetics, identities, and narratives. Jill Moniz is an independent-minded curator of visual narratives. Her curatorial investigations launched from her project space Quotidian and the nonprofit Transformative Arts support local artists in site-specific installations and exhibitions that create much needed visual language for the greater good. Her noted exhibitions in Los Angeles include Los LA Blacksmith at the California African American Museum and The Riddle Effect at Craft Contemporary. Jill, I hand it off to you. Thanks, Greg. It's my pleasure to introduce the third conversation for the Photo Flux and Shuttering LA exhibition at the Getty. For Beyond the Frame, I brought together three artists from different places and with different practices, but who all extend the visual image in dynamic ways, whether it's into three dimensions or the realm of multimedia, each artist liberates photography from the camera, from its history and from categories of documentation, ethnography and white power. Whenever I'm working with these artists and I try to make that as often as I can, I learned so much about what it means to map cultural production and our praxis in a universe of one's own making. How refusing the confines of the medium makes the work and us so much richer by moving the complexity of our lives and our own thinking from the periphery to the center. And one of the things that excites me the most is that their interests are always making space for us in their explorations. By bringing us along, they do not speak for their community but with them. Tonight, I hope you will be content to listen to the diverse but intersecting ways these artists, who I call my friends, expand and empower art making. First, I'd like to introduce them to you. Mercedes Dormi is a visual artist who calls on her Tongva ancestry to engage the problematics of visibility, ideas of cultural construction, and ancestral connection to land and sky. Dormi recently received a Creative Capital Award and was honored by UCLA as an outstanding alumna of the last hundred years working in equal justice. She was part of the Hammer Museum's Biennial Made in LA 2018 and has shown her work internationally. Kyungmi Shin is a mixed media artist whose work investigates cultural hybridity that results from immigration and colonization. In her recent body of work in painted photo collage and ceramics, she combines family photographs with historical chinoiserie paintings, Christian narratives from medieval manuscripts, and Buddhist narratives from a Chinese classic, Journey to the West. She immigrated from South Korea in 1983 to the US and currently lives and works in LA. Since 2006, she maintains a studio home and artist residency in Ghana with her partner, Todd Gray. Corey Newkirk was born in the Bronx, New York and received his BFA from the School of Art Institute of Chicago and his MFA from the University of California, Irvine. He also attended the Skowhegan School of Painting. He is a William H. Johnson prize winner 
and his work has been shown in solo and group shows around the world, including a 10-year survey exhibition at the Studio Museum of Harlem. Corey and his work have been written about in various publications across the spectrum. He lives and works in Los Angeles. It is now my pleasure to introduce Corey to you for this great conversation. Hi, <clears throat> welcome everybody. I'm super excited that you are all here to join with us in this uh, amazing conversation we're gonna have today between uh, Mercedes, Kyungmi, and myself. Um, so I have a long page of notes here that I'm not sure I'm going to uh, fully follow whatsoever. We're just gonna have a really amazing conversation, but before we get too deep into it, I'm just gonna say there are some things that I, I hope we might be able to touch upon some aspects of like, the potential of photography as magic, performative photography, landscape photography, of course, the past, the present, some time travel issues, <laughs> um, identity, architecture, and again, landscape, uh, lots of things and layers and layers and layers and layers of things. So um, with that being said, I think the first question I would love to uh, get started with is I'm gonna ask Kyung Mi, when did you make your first cut? Cutting of photograph? Cutting of the photographs. You know, I think I, I asked this because in a way that's sort of a radical act, right? In some regards, right? We're not supposed to destroy these things and a, a cut uh, resonates in so many different ways. Sort of the rupture of the surface of the, of the paper, of the substrate, just sort of uh, the potential destruction. If you could maybe talk a little bit about your first cut. Yeah, uh, the first cutting, I guess I could call it a photograph was actually with a newspaper. Um, when the Iraq war started, um, I collected all the war coverage of New York Times, which was like the center section that they had a uh, nation at war or something section. So I collected all those photographs and I had a stack of these uh, newspaper and I, started to kind of think of ways of kind of um, looking at these images in a, in a different ways. And I started to cut out the soldiers from the newspaper. And so after I think it was three months or four months of that section, I decided to create an installation. And so when I hung these uh, newspaper uh, almost as a sculptural form, I noticed that the kind of juxtaposition of the narrative that is behind these pages. So uh, when these are viewed from behind, you see these uh, uh, soldiers going across the page and on the backside, there's a story about the villagers that was devastated by the war. And so I really um, thought it was interesting to kind of see these as a sculptural um, kind of, uh, you know, this paper as a sculptural material. So that was the beginning of it. And I did a whole series of cut photographs and in the most uh, recent cut uh, photograph, I uh, printed um, images on both sides of photo paper. So I can cut and create that kind of a narrative juxtaposition. And in this case, I was using images of uh, royal carriages from Portugal. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, I had uh, photographs uh, that I've taken from Ghana to kind of, you know, look at the relation, colonial relationships between those two countries. Oh, nice, nice. Mercedes, I know you don't necessarily cut a lot of things up. <laughs> no. am, am I correct? But I think- Well- Oh, oh, please come on. No, no, I was, I, it made me think, I remember, um, Actually, when I was in grad school, I had this moment where I was working with images and they like, I felt like they weren't doing what I wanted to do with them. And I got very frustrated and I started kind of writing on them. And then at one point I like hung them with a nail, like hammering through. And it was like talking about like doing something you've like, it's like so like feels like you're not supposed to like rupture that plane. You're not supposed to damage, like they're, they're treated normally so preciously, but there was something really freeing about um, knowing how the image, when it functions as it, it's meant to function and, and where it, um, it, you know, it, I think for me needs a different um, approach. 
So. Mm -hmm. Right, but it's also, you know, I think those moments are, are, can be really important too, right? Where we yeah. are of, often taught not to do things and we, we become sort of rebellious or uh, we break the, the rules that that's who knows who really put those things on there. And I think that that is always so good to have. I mean, I know that I try to uh, do it consciously sometimes and it just sometimes happens unconsciously, but I think it really can have such a important impact on the rest of our practice too, when we sort of give ourselves that permission to mm -hmm. be transgressive even if it is a little thing or a large thing, it can really have uh, such great implications and ramifications. Do you think uh, all, all three of, of us are not uh, uh, trained as uh, in the kind of a photographic tradition, even though we use photographs in our work a lot? Do you think that in a way gives us some sort of a freedom to do, because we don't know the rules as well? <laughs> I, think, I think she has a, um, I kind of came through the, the training. I, the, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. You're talking about me um, and Corey then. <laughs> yeah. No, but you know, I, I think that that is interesting. I, you know, I, I teach a lot and I do have uh, some students who are, tend to focus in photography, mm -hmm. but it seems as though uh, it more and more, it is really, similar in that way, right? That there is no sort of, I, I find myself dealing with people who don't ha necessarily have super strong ties to a, a traditional notion of what photography is. I think, you know, everyone's also walking around with a camera in yeah. their pocket mm -hmm. in some way, whether they choose to use it that way or not. So those kind of questions about like, tradition and training and usage and use value, I, you know, are always really interesting to me because I don't know if we can still hold on to those so tightly, um, even though I'm sure there's people who will always do that, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I always thought of a uh, photograph as uh, one of the material, like a sculptural material. So I think, my relationship to, to photography is very different because uh, in my earliest sculptures, I use photograph as the kind of the part of the sculptural form. So perhaps the relationship to photography is uh, very different for a sculptor than a photographer, I think. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I also teach and I teach a foundation class. So we're getting it like that entry level moment Mm -hmm. um, and so, but it's in the photo, photo media program. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I do think that there are some of those like uh, modes, some modalities in, the, in which photography was used in its inception that are kind of like, you know, going back to, you know, how it was used in anthropology to kind of type people or create another or how it was used for like police photography. And so in some of these modes in which it was kind of, I kind of feel like, I, I really make it a point to teach these things to my students because I feel like um, walking down this path where you're in this trajectory of, of image making, um, being aware of those things is a way to kind of push against. Like I know I, I in my own practice use it's like almost the logic against itself. You know, I play with the logic, you know, playing with coding the land as indigenous as a way to, um, play with this idea of the photograph as evidence and kind of, you know, um, fine, like, or permanence, a permanent record. So some of these things, um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's a, I think for me having that kind of um, ingrained history or, or um, studio, you know, practice or, or techno technique maybe is a way that I kind of push against it um, in a lot of ways. That's so interesting. I love the idea. I love when um, we as artists can talk about, uh, consciously talk about the notion of pushing against, right? When we can actually it, perhaps step back from some things and go, oh, I am actually doing this thing and I'm pushing, pushing back in a way. And Mercedes, I loved uh, what you were talking about. It really made me think about a little bit about when you were talking about being in the landscape and sort of pushing back and what happens 
with that because I've really been, when I've looked at your work uh, lately, I've really been thinking about the notion of a performative photograph, right? Where, where it's not about being, and that's from my notes, not about being a document in the traditional ways that we understand a document, but a performative act uh, between the viewer, uh, the, the actual work and the maker. Right, and so that it it seems like they they float in this very interesting space, uh, like that. Yeah, it's I'm smiling because I just taught a class titled "Sites of Performative Arrangement" because I'm super interested in these <laughs> um, photographic. I started calling them photographic records because document didn't quite feel right because, right. <laughs> but it's these you know, the, the performative aspects are so important to me. I think even back to like um, Dutch still life painting where it was the arrangement. Yes, the mm -hmm. painting was incredible, but the meaning was built in the arrangement. And I think then the way I make images in a landscape, it's the arrangement and the performative elements of the action happening there um, that then gets recorded by the camera. But then I'm not trying to translate it directly. I'm not trying to translate the experience directly. I'm still taking the camera and using it as a um, way to show the viewer exactly what I want them to see. And you know, like it's a way of um, being so intentional and in, in how I want something to be. I mean, all the words framed, you know, focus, mm -hmm. all these kind of lens based words that we use are very much like part of that pro process. But no, I think of ant works like Anna Mendieta or Gabriel Rosco, these kind of images that are the kind of record or after echo of the performative action. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm really interested in it. Like I am excited because I'm really interested in, in this like conversations around the, the performative or kind of- Well, I, it's yeah. interesting because when I hear you talk about those artists and I also love them, I, what I'm really talking about also, and I'm not sure if I, it's like the actual piece of photographic, whatever you printed that on is the, is the performative thing, right? The, the actual mm -hmm. materiality of the object or the piece of paper, or the, the substrate that you printed on is the thing that becomes the performance actually. So it, again, that's why I was talking about that, uh, that relationship between the viewer, the work, which is actually doing the performative thing, and then the maker who is, you know, you're not doing the performance in that way. So it's this very interesting, like inanimate, inanimate performance of this inanimate flat thing on the wall that it's just, <laughs> it's really, I don't even know if I can articulate it in the way that it, the work is operating for me in that way. Amazing. No, I mean, that makes sense. I, 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 I think that's really beautiful. I like that idea that the, mm -hmm. the photograph is the performance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, what else do we want to talk about? Yeah, uh, <laughs> speaking about the performative, like the actual idea of the performative thing, I would love, you know, I think um, that makes me think about the notion of layers that I think happen, I think in, in all of our work in different ways and layers of, of physicality, again, the materiality of the actual things, um, the multitude of layers of meaning, the multitudinous uh, layers of making and understanding and um, you know, uh, what is that word? Our uh, subjectivity, mm, I got some big words today. Mm -hmm. You know, the layers of the subjectivity, the things that are going on. Uh, it's, it's really great. I would love if, if we could just maybe touch upon that for a second. If you either of you want to talk about some layering, what that means. Of, of the meanings? Well, I mean, it, I, I, I don't know if it, if you can talk about it in any way you want. I mean, I <laughs> like that that there are layers. So it can be, um, you can respond to that anyway. I, right? I don't, it doesn't have to be about meaning. It could be like, you know, honestly, I like lots of layers and cutting things up too, just cause I like to um, rebuild things. So that's in a way what I'm thinking about some aspects of the layering in terms of the reconstruction that can happen in that way. Yeah that I think uh, we all kind of share some of that in that universe building way. 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, actually, I'd love to hear uh, your perspective on your work in terms of layering Corey also. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to start off? <laughs> um, not particularly, but I, I, will, I will try. Um, you know, uh, I consciously always try to, um, I don't know what I'm trying to do. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I want, I, you know, earlier I was talking to Jill and we were, she was mentioning this thing that is unmentionable and almost unreachable, mm -hmm. uh, ungraspable by us as artists. And so the idea of layers, you know, mm -hmm. I, I sometimes I like to make things difficult, <laughs> not only for myself, but for the ways in which people can understand what I'm putting out there right, intentionally to um, obfuscate or whatever, make it not so immediately gettable. And so that's how sometimes I think, at first, if I'm gonna think about layers right now, uh, I will do that as a, perhaps as a way of self-preservation and protection and um, mm -hmm. sort of uh, critical distancing mm -hmm. that, that I feel is important in, what I am trying to say at some times, right? Mm, that's interesting. So I've been thinking actually a lot about layering uh, as a tools to introduce um, complexities into the work. So uh, my challenge has been to kind of deal with different things that I wanna add to my work, uh, yet, kind of keep a certain amount of transparency physically as well as uh, as a meaning. So they, uh, the uh, all these layers of meaning or visual elements can work together and kind of become a, a coherent uh, expression of some sort. So some uh, meaning or some historical narrative I have in the back of my mind and I'm trying to look for certain things that are present that um, to introduce, you know, to come to my work. Um, I, so I really think of as uh, layers as a tool to, that we can use as artists to introduce these things. Um, so yeah, I guess it's both physical as well as, um, as a meaning in terms of you know, the idea of layering. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot about um, the research that I do, like I'm always kind of pulling from like a past and a future or trying to at least to kind of create something. And I love like this idea. I, I, I used to be a little like hesitant to say this so much, but intentionally making something a little bit difficult to grasp is something I've done like always because, you know, when you think about um, I think about all the work that I've done to understand my own Tongva ancestry, my own kind of history, and it's really difficult. And there are these holes and gaps in the history because of how devastating colonization was in the Los Angeles area and California and the United States and the Americas. You know, I could go keep going full on that, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, you know, I always felt like it was this work that had to be done to understand something. And I, oh, and I felt it was almost disingenuous to give the viewer something that they could be like, oh, native, <laughs> terrible trauma, walk away. I get it. Cause it's like, I don't hundred percent get it all the time. And so I was always trying to kind of make it, um, make my images or my installations or my work, this thing that could be experienced, could be appreciated, could be um, accessed in ways, but would more kind of create this, desire hopefully for people to want to understand more or to kind of do mm. some work around um, that. So I, I, de I definitely agree that um, there's so much that goes into what comes out, um, you know, even in like a, I don't want to say timeline because it's more spirally circular, more circular than a line, but mm -hmm. um, those overlaps and overlays I think are super mm. present um, important. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Oh, that was so Can I throw in a question or a comment or maybe that we might all like, I feel like there are elements in your work, Corey, as well, and in Mercedes, your work. I'm wondering the kind of the role of like uh, imagination or fiction 
or kind of fantasy, surreal kind of juxtaposition that plays into your photographic work or does your work in general? Because as you're talking about Mercedes, about how you, in a way you have to imagine certain things or you have to kind of invent things, right? And so it, it, I'd be really curious about, you know, both of you, in both of your work, how that imagination or uh, fiction kind of plays into constructing the work. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like I'm talking a lot, but go, if okay, Corey, no, no, you want to go first? Okay, okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. I mean, I think I can okay. try to talk about that. That's so interesting. Um, you know, my, of course, my imagination plays around with all of this stuff and, and fiction uh, has a role in there. But, you know, when I think about the majority of the image making and photography sort of lens based work that I make it, that stuff does not really uh, play a big role, right? That, I say that, I think that aspect plays a role in other parts of my practice, but a lot of my image, photographic image making is uh, through direct observation uh, and uh, a little bit of serendipity perhaps, but a lot of uh, real just pure looking and not about a construction of the, uh, of things necessarily uh, so much anymore, uh, more about the discovery of things, right? Uh, so that's interesting because we were also talking about all, you know, I was talking with someone, you know, that conversation about, is it a window, a mirror or a door? And so we, I was having this conversation about, not with you two, but about us. And it was interesting because in a way, Kung Kyung Mi, you are like the window. Your work is like the window. And uh, Mercedes, you're like the door, particularly, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. the door. And then I would be the mirror. Right, so I'm really trying to hold it up and reflect back, and you two are uh, uh, letting us enter in other ways, right? Mm -hmm. Open the door, the portal, right? In that way, uh, right. and the windows uh, back through the multi multitudinous layers of history and thought, and you know, um, mm -hmm. globalness. Uh, so it's really interesting. Okay, I, so that I think that is how I. Um, <laughs> deal with fiction and my imagination in that type of work. It doesn't really, um, I don't think it plays too much of a, a front facing role. It might come later though, but mostly because the work is made in a certain way, it, it, it only, it operates in a different way. Maybe in your titles. Could, it could be there. Because, <laughs> I think, if I could maybe project or not project, but observe. Yeah. Um, but um, no, I think that the whole, the role of like fact in conjunction with photography, I, I came into photography through actually photojournalism, which is oh, wow. um, where, where you're supposed to, I worked on a school newspaper and, you know, it was all kind of a certain ethos around what the, photo the photograph was supposed to represent. Um, and so I, you know, Again, it's one of those moments where I like to kind of play against, um, like we use the logic against itself of, of creating, uh, you know, records of fact or presence. Um, and it took me a long time to acknowledge that there was um, a narrative being created by myself that was not like perfect. You know, I like like I was saying these gaps in our history and our culture. I don't know everything. I can't know everything. Um, and and I, there was certain a certain moment actually when I started working with the, the sculptural um, star stones that I make. That you know these are objects that are really beautiful, very intentionally made. We as people don't know what they were used for, which is really kind of heartbreaking to me. But they, but so that's the moment where I'm like, okay, this could be like devastating and depressing, or I can say, okay. I'm going to create a meaning for these. And so I take it and I, you know, try to be very forward about being like, this is my interpretation. I'm not trying to say I represent the Tongva authoritative voice or meaning or anything like that. It's me saying, okay, I'm going to um, create an imagination for these objects and a use and a purpose and a, and a, and a yeah, you know, 
I would say that uh, fiction and truth are not necessarily on uh, opposite ends of the spectrum, you know? And so that, you know, I, I think that in being empowered to allow myself to engage in the um, imagination around it has been really important. Um, mm -hmm. That it's not, um, there's so many issues around authenticity, real and unreal, you know, that are so um, heavy and burdensome. And so for me, it's mm -hmm. about like lifting that off and kind of empowering myself and hopefully other people who are interested in, you know, this kind of, you know, as Corey said, subjectivity and looking at the world and, and you know, giving something. Mm -hmm. um, so oh, I definitely beautiful. play with these. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Those burdens are a bummer. I'm so glad, you know, I love the <laughs> idea that you were able to, again, give yourself that permission to be like, to throw that stuff off. I think it's important for all of us to do that. Um, we have a question. <clears throat> um, I'm going to read this if you got, uh, so the question, uh, layering equals collage. It's, it seems like a three-part question. I don't think I was talking about, uh, or I think we were implying about layering equaling collage. I think in, in this conversation, uh, layering, I would use it in the most expansive way possible. So it could, it, of course, that is inclusive of collage, but I think, as I said, it is, uh, it can be a, emotional, physical, literal, conceptual. It is just the idea of uh, layer. Uh, all right. And the next part is there are deep historical roots to photo based work. Can you name some of your favorite pioneers in this area, Man Ray, etc.? Uh, and there's another part after that, but uh, if we want to touch on that. I think for me, the, the Hannah Hawk, the photo collage, mm -hmm. as I'm sure for many artists who do photo collage, uh, her work has been always very powerful and inspiring to me. So it's a quick question, short question. <laughs> good one. I, I totally forgot about it. I haven't thought about that or her work in a long time, but I do remember very groundbreaking shows that I, I saw. Okay, uh, and how do you feel about artists uh, who perform with their photo-based work? And then there's names Gustav Brahms, R.S. Park, Harrison, and, and uh, thank you. So, I mean, I think that's interesting about the notion of artists who perform with their photo-based work. I'm, I, I am assuming that must mean performing in the work, not like, you know, dancing around with the photograph, even though that's probably where I would um, go myself. Mm -hmm. Before I mean, I think of like, well, no, go ahead. I'm just trying. I was just gonna throw out the name for Francesca Woodman, because I feel like that was somebody mm -hmm. I remember seeing early on that kind of straddles this line. Yes, it's like self, portrait in a way, but it kind of transcends into something else. Um, that's you know, top of my head. that is so interesting because I'm, I'm sitting here racking my brain. And then I remember that I have always had a fascination with the John's Copla John Copland's photographs, those self portraits of his aging body that were mm -hmm. uh, sort of butted up against each other. So in a way the abstracted performative uh, body in that way were always very interesting to me. And I think Mercedes earlier, you even mentioned Laura Aguilar and those photographs, even from a very, very young age, flipping through those Janssen art history books, you know, when you're lucky enough to see one of those, they, they can really continue to resonate because they, they really can be super visceral in, in some really great ways. And then uh, of course, Ana Mendieta's work is very performative. Um, mm -hmm. Um, as well, yeah, yeah. Um, great. Uh, I we have a we have a, we have a little uh, shout out here. I would love to um, hear how you two talk, or uh, if we if we could all talk, not just you two, about some notions of identity, because I think that historically, mm -hmm. photo uh, based work has had a strong connection to notions of identity, right? As we talked about doors, windows, mirrors, and how that can operate in that way. And um, just perhaps it's about documentation. It's about proof. Could it be about um, 
truth and truthiness in those ways. I, I think um, I, when I think about both of your practices, I, I see sort of um, operations and uh, around your identity, right? Like it's, uh, that, that deal directly and indirectly with questions about the who, what, where, why, and how of who you are and what it sort of means to exist right now. And I would love if we could, um, if you could, we could touch upon some aspects of that in regards to like pictures or <laughs> photos and everything. Yeah. Um, I could uh, start if uh, Mercedes, if it's okay. Um, I started to use my family photographs in my recent works and um, it's, in a way, it's a way of dealing with your own, uh, even though it, I don't use a lot of uh, photographs that I am in, 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 in the picture, but looking at older photographs and um, it is a way of kind of investigating, um, I guess my heritage or my history. But what I realized was that in investigating family albums or images from uh, an older images, it is a record, a personal record, but also it's a record of, of the culture or the economies or the habits and customs that's kind of represented in, in the clothing, in the objects, in the surroundings. So I became really fascinated with how photographs can uh, uh, give us so much information about the, the time, not just the personal choice of uh, recording a certain event uh, and things like that. So I really um, became interested in using uh, these family photographs as a tool to not only to talk about my personal kind of history, but also as a, a record of the um, kind of moment, that historical moment and the connections uh, that I could kind of make. So in that way, I guess I thought it was a great in a way, tool to kind of investigate my own uh, identity uh, to kind of uh, tie back to the question. Um, I guess also in terms as an artist, you know, if you have, uh, you know, identity uh, as as a as a you know um, Asian American, I think a lot about talk kind of dealing with identity in my work, and sometimes I would like to you know just. Um, as a poet said, write about flowers instead of, <laughs> but um, I, now I feel very, um, I feel an urgency kind of to talk about uh, my, my heritage and myself in a way, um, in, in a poetic manner, you know, um, as well. So um, I like to kind of look at the history, look at the historical forces, look at the trades, and in, and um, and uh, currently, I'm also very interested in um, looking at the religious, um, uh, the kind of role role of religion in this colonial expansion and cultural kind of expansion. So um, it is very multifaceted in terms of kind of who I am as a person. Uh, all these cultural influences have so much. Um, so much force, so many forces behind it. So I'm kind of, you know, trying to look at all those forces, uh, powers behind it and try to deal with it in my work and visualize it in a way that is compelling and, and complicated as much as possible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I totally feel you in that, the, the poetry quote where you, <laughs> um, <laughs> sometimes, but I also feel like I'm, um, working from my lived experience you mm -hmm. know and so I'm always kind of um responding to those things that I have experienced and continue to kind of move mm -hmm. through this world as you know a person with brown skin and brown hair and brown eyes is and you know has strangers come up to them maybe less more in the past but now ask well what are you you know where are you from <laughs> you know like mm -hmm. oh, you know it it was really common um and you know one of the most, some of the most formative experiences that I had that really pushed me into, you know, delving into my relationship with the land and the landscapes and Los Angeles 
Los Angeles in particular, was working on sites as a cultural resource consultant um, where our ancestors and their things were being excavated for housing developments or developments wow. of some sort. And it was, it was a really, you know, I did this when I was very young for a good amount of years. And, you know, it was this really difficult process that I went through. Um, it's kind of ties into my interest in objects and, you know, like exploring objects and their, the context that they can, um, of us and then also this kind of really difficult experience that I, I felt like I had to kind of process and work through in a way that felt healing sense you kind of threw out photography as magic early on and I was like you know I I think about um these things where you know when I'm making work I get into this space that's not something I get into when I'm doing other things and know being in the land and the landscape and these spaces and the smells and the air and the sun like all of those things kind of go into the experience of that that making um and so um and I also early on you know talking about family photos was given this you know disc of images and I were you know working through those um one of my very early series was called living proof because I I was really trying to understand what it meant to be indigenous city that really didn't want you to be visible in that way. Um, so yeah, it, 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 it like as much as I started off saying like, oh, I'd love to talk about other things. It's almost, it feels um, it, like impossible for me. It's it, mm -hmm. not impossible. Nothing's impossible, no, no, but it, it, it feels an, a, a necessary. Yeah, go ahead. It just feels it seems necessary. unnecessary. I mean, I, I, I no. also, <laughs> as someone who has been also making work about his own or identity for you know a long time now. Um, I too also um, not that I want to make things about flowers, but you know <laughs> I have to. I had to give myself permission at some point to say that I think uh, while it is so important for me to make this work that sort of talks about these things, uh, it is also important for me to not at times, right? That to give myself that permission to make what the heck ever that I want to make, whether it is tied to what is expected of me by this larger messed up sort of art world or whatever, or, uh, you know, so I think that um, hopefully we can all get there, you know, that you will be able to, at some point, I know you'll be able to be like, I can, I'm just gonna make things about flowers, right? Like, because I have to, in a way that is, helps balance the, the really uncomfortable and difficult things sometimes that we are really trying to make work about that I think if that is the only thing that we were to concentrate all the time on, we would go nuts, right? Your head would explode because you do need some sort of um, release valve. And I, I, and I think that that sort of pressure because of who we are, uh, that's outside pressure because of who we three are and the work and the type of work that is often expected of us that I think it's also very important to be resistant to that and to be able to push back and go, uh-uh, I'm gonna make whatever I want mm -hmm. and that's okay. And Corey, do you think, um, I, 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 would, I can't remember if we talked about uh, every day when we had a pre-conversation kind of um, working with the everyday or the vernacular or the mundane mm -hmm. kind of as a subject matter and as a way to, in a way, um, kind of talk, you know, we talk about identity in a kind of from a different perspective or celebrating this uh, simple, um, instead of just the trauma or mm. the conflict and the challenges as a kind of counterpoint to that. Um, does that work into your practice or you think? Uh, yes, I, I, I like the idea, yes, as the, the counterpoint to a sort of uh, what seems to be an expect, perhaps an expected trauma. I think Mercedes talks a little bit about that, the, the, you know, the way in which photography had historically been used about, you know, she talks about ro the romantic portraits and the sort of, you know, the, the white saviors that come to all these places. And so, you know, there's the, the traumaticness of uh, the visual and, the, and that I think photography works so well with. 
Um, yeah, I, I just like to operate from a place of, you know, self-love and try not mm -hmm. to sort of um, go necessarily into the, all those other places, right? I think the world already demands so much of me, so much flesh already. It just every day that um, I try in my work, even though it might not look like that again on the surface, that it is about uh, a, a different kind of experience and response that I think is based in self-love and tries to be very generous mm -hmm. and is optimistic mm -hmm. in some ways, right? Because uh, I got no choice, but uh, has to be <laughs> optimistic. But those things, again, if we go back to the layers and all the the hidden thing, right? I think you guys are like excavators and I, like of those layers and I am the, uh, the, 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 the builder of the, the pushbacker wall maker, perhaps. <laughs> I don't know. I think, um, yeah. I was yeah. gonna say, I think it's really beautiful and important to embrace like joy and freedom. I heard Carrie Mae Weems give a talk and she talked about instead of it was a, a group of people in the street, it wasn't a protest, it was a procession. And there was something beautiful about the way that the celebration, the celebratory mm -hmm. idea of that was so like, empowering. Cause you're like, you, I think those spaces of joy and freedom are so important to access and embrace. So. I, I, amen to that. And I think <laughs> yeah. that we, I think that that in some regards is almost like one of all, can be one of our jobs, right? As artists to, to mine those things, right? I don't know what uh, the job of an artist is necessarily uh, these days, but uh, there it uh, historically perhaps, yes, bringing joy uh, could be nice. Even now it would be nice to, to, uh, to be generous and bring joy and to find joy in the making, which I loved uh, Mercedes when you talked about that. Because really, um, I mean, I think the things that you're dealing with uh, can elicit some not so great feelings, <laughs> right? And uh, I, I, I'm, I've been really interested in, to think and thinking about like where, I don't wanna use anger, but like, you know, perhaps it's frustration uh, plays a role in that, uh, but I think I don't want to go there today because we're really talking about self-love and being generous. We'll talk about that later. <clears throat> um, we do have some more questions. Would you like to hear some? Uh, well, I think we have a question about landscape, place, and the vibrancy of the LA community and how that plays a role in our work and how does art make place for you and in interventions in our expressions. But I mean, I think we could talk about, um, I think Los Angeles specifically plays a, a pretty big role in all of our practices in, in some regards uh, from the actual physicality of the, the area to the visuality, the particular visualness uh, of Southern California, and particularly Los Angeles. Do, do we talk? I mean, Kyung I read somewhere, someone said that, you know, talked about a socio architecture hmm. Hmm. with uh, your work, which I thought was interesting. And then I thought about, I, I really originally wrote down a socio landscape for. Uh, uh, like Mercedes, but Jill corrected me, and I think she uh, said it was another kind of landscape, but I can't remember what it is. But actually, to me, it really feels like uh, memory. An aspect of memory is playing in there, but it's really something else too. But uh, I'd love to hear yeah. you talk um, about um, landscape. Mm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, I when you say memory, um, I was I was I started braiding sweetgrass, which is good so far. I haven't finished it, but uh, she mentioned something that she says ceremony is remembering to remember. I think was the phrase, which I thought was really beautiful. Mm. 
Um, I, I do think about how I point the camera in these spaces in Los Angeles, particularly because of my ties there. And I always try to choose sites that are really intentional. The materials I use are intentional, the objects I use are intentional and the sites. And, you know, in some ways it's to reference um, backwards, like memory, history, presence of the past. I like to look at places where there's water springs because people always need water, right? So if you look at spaces where there's a spring in Los Angeles, you can imagine that people always wanted to be near that, right? Um, but it's not just about looking back. It's also about, you know, me in the moment making that image. And that's kind of where the perform performativity and the intervention comes into play where I'm clearly there's a human presence in the image, even though there's not often people in my images. Um, and then that also is hopefully a way to project forward, again, making these permanent records and also kind of a continued presence. I was working on this other project and I landed on this phrase about the continuum of presence, that it's not like an individual point in time, even though photographs did do kind of, you know, I think Kim, you're talking about how photographs give us so much information of a moment. My dad was always like, put a car in your picture and people will always know like when it was from. And it's true, you look at images of cars and you're like, you're right, dad. <laughs> but, um, you know, in these images, I'm trying to also push forward right the, you know there's a continued presence that it's like a future looking forward looking um you know visual physical literal presence um mm -hmm. i'm not sure i exactly answered but that's kind of how i look at how i look at space particularly and like the visuals of how Lo los angeles is conceptualized mm -hmm. mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, 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 this question is interesting. It's, I think, very uh, important question, but also it's a difficult question in a way for me in the sense that I think I, the way I engage with uh, the city that where I'm living in, I think is very different uh, in how it um, uh, shows up in my work. At, uh, in some uh, earlier works, I, that, was all about, all my work was about kind of documenting what I was seeing in the city. I did a whole in, I think around two, uh, 2000 or 2000, 2001, I did a, like a one year photo documentation slash performative project where I photographed um, everything I saw that was color blue. And I just read an interview of you, Corey that said color blue is very important to you. So I thought that was kind of amazing that because I did this one year performative exercise and that was very uh, transformative in terms of how my um, experience transformed during that year because I every day became very poetic because uh, what I previously saw as maybe a trash became an art object and every day was a good art day because I made photographs and so it was really interesting how um, uh, my perspective or certain criteria that I gave myself to uh, look at the world transformed my experience. So I think in during that year, my I, I was trying to be out in you know the streets or out, you know record as much as I could, and my relationship to the city had changed a lot. Whereas I think um, I did a series of work where I did photo collages of buildings, and so I did a lot of. Um, uh, photo collages of LA because that's where I live and Inglewood, you know, where I was living there. So it really became a uh, record, but then creating a kind of a fantasy landscape using uh, those uh, photographs. I feel like it depends on where my focus is in terms of creative kind of approach. The relationship to the city uh, changes um, in terms of how it manifests itself in my work. I don't even know if I'm, I've questioned <laughs> if I answered the question, but that's where my thoughts went. <laughs> I think you answered that amazingly. I think you both answered that amazingly well. I, I mean, yeah, you, you actually, because I'm sitting here going, how am I going to answer this? But I, I actually <laughs> think that uh, I realize, listening to you, Kyungmi, to, to realize that, you know, my, my LA landscape that I deal with, that I respond to is downtown. Right. This is the only place that I have ever lived uh, in all of these years in Los Angeles. Um, 
and so this is my laboratory, uh, my classroom, uh, my art supply store, <laughs> my, my, my everything. Um, you know, it was again, in a way, a resistance against the way the rest of the city looked when I was looking, right? Uh, I, I need um, big buildings to feel in a way secure <laughs> in, in an <laughs> urban environment. I, I need um, people. Uh, I need, I, I desire active uh, public space and I, I have found it in a really um, interesting, often overlooked and ignored place that I loved because no one was paying any attention to it. Now it's a whole nother matter, but that's, you know, a whole nother much longer um, one of these conversations. But, you know, my, 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 I think all of our experiences here from three different uh, perspectives about three different uh, Los Angeles landscapes that we deal with directly in, in, within the work that talk about our identity as uh, human beings, artists, and, and Los Angelinos is really interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Um, lots of good questions. Is there any, uh, am I missing anything? Did I not, did we not touch on anything that could be really amazing that you, you two would like <laughs> to share, to continue to share? Um, Oh, would you like to, you know, I, I'm gonna, I'm, we're gonna go a little longer because there's, there's some questions here that I think are very interesting. Um, thank you for your incredible practice. This may be, we, we might have already answered this, but we're, I'm just gonna ask you this. How do you navigate your practices being both based in the US and diaspora, you know, in the diaspora and the more prominent race-based lens here in the US? In our journeys, how do you see artists outside of the US racial identity based work makes photo based work more I, i'm not sure if i understand that but i think it's kind of a, a a question about how we deal with these things and versus perhaps how people in other places deal with these issues i think it, i think it's totally it can be very different yeah i think uh, maybe if i could start first mm -hmm. um i think i thought that's uh question that I ask myself quite a lot because I am from a different place originally and I came here almost 40 years ago and I identify myself as an American but an Asian American Korean American and it is quite different from being a Korean right and so but I do have this cultural heritage from back in Korea back in Asia so I, when I'm kind of doing my research and thinking about myself and kind of uh, in terms of like, oh, can I claim this as my culture or can I, um, it's really a com complex question. And what I try to do in my practice is just, I, I could only look at it from this perspective in a way, uh, in the sense that um, who I am is this hybrid. And so I've been really interested in looking at the hybridity and in that manifests in, in a lot of different cultures. And in a way, um, it's impossible to have a culture that is cut off from uh, an influence from another culture. It's always been a co very connected world. So um, myself as a Korean American, it's a very hybrid kind of, um, presence in terms of cultural, uh, different cultures that are mixing. But even people who are born and raised uh, generation after generation in the US, I would say there is so much cultural hybridity in that we breathe in, that live, that we live in, even in, in, you know, in, uh, in the culture, in, in the food, in, you know, in the visual um, things, in objects. Um, so, I think I now forget actually the, what the, <laughs> exactly what the, how the question uh, was formulated, but um, I think uh, a lot about also the differentiation between being an Asian versus being an Asian American. So as, an, as, a, as a Korean American, I, as a Korean American artist, I try to um, 
I'm hoping that I can bring, create artworks or have a voice that has another layer of complexity or richness that I can bring in because of the, the, the hybridity that I um, uh, am living uh, as an immigrant. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's uh, yeah, that I'd like to kind of end at that point, but it's a, it's a rich question and that's something that I struggle with or kind of deal with always. Mm -hmm. Mercedes, would you like to touch on that? There is another question which could be interesting as well. And then I think we're gonna to need to start to wrap this up. It's, it's, it's related. So uh, we are being asked, how do you feel about people potentially or actually misinterpreting your work, especially when it comes to dimensions that have to do with your identity? I, I will say that, mm -hmm. you know, that you know that is just something, in, in a way it just comes with the territory for me, right? I, like. Uh, my, uh, there is so, it, may, perhaps that is because I'm trying to, as I mentioned earlier, uh, make it difficult. So uh, it is open to interpretation and it is open to misinterpretation. And I fully understand that once I relinquish uh, the work, once I release it out into the world, I can't control it whatsoever. But I lose uh, control of the interpretation of that work 100%. So, um, you know, I, I can't stay up at night worrying about that. Not my, not my issue, but I think it's always interesting to, uh, to think about. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree, like, you know, you can't control everything. Um, I think feedback is good. Like, you know, so I try to kind of bounce things off people. So, cause sometimes I can see one thing one way and somebody <laughs> says something, I'm like, oh my God, I did not see that at all. So like, you know, there's some sort of like um, bouncing off that I think is important. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I, you know, so, okay. So I wouldn't be, you know, you can't control everything. So I'm not gonna like, again, stay up at night, like, you know, so upset, but I try to be super intentional um, this is something I've learned about didactics, the text, you know, the words that go with it. And, you know, yes, we are visual artists and I, I go into this a lot in teaching, but the words are also really important for me at least. And so when I'm at referencing points that are out of research or out of the culture or our language, which I use sometimes, um, you know, I'm really intentional about, you know, what is written, you know, trying to like get a, a, an edit if possible, not an edit, but like a read through because it's, it is really tricky. It is really difficult. And I've, like I said, I spent years and years and years of my life doing, um, you know, work in this area. So like, I've become very intentional about um, the, the way that um, what's built around the work. Um, and that's how I try to manage it. I also do a lot of artist talks, talks like this, you know, <laughs> where you get out and you talk about where you're coming from. So, you know, if someone has an hour to sit and watch a video later on, they can, they can, you know, spend some time to hear. I, I feel like hearing from an artist from you too. Um, anytime I get this opportunity, it's, I'm so grateful for it because it's, it's so enriching to hear somebody coming from where they you know, their heart and speaking mm. about their work. Um, so that's kind of how I manage that. Oh my goodness, that was so sweet. Thank you. Yeah. And I think on that, we, we need to wrap this up. That was, <laughs> that's the perfect way to uh, let us all say goodbye. Uh, so we're gonna, how about we, we say goodbye. I would like to thank uh, Hyunmi and Mercedes for joining me in this amazing conversation. I'd like to thank Jill and Moniz and the Getty for uh, letting us um, stick our stuff up in your in your in the castle. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, I think there's more of these programs to come. So keep your peepers on your email, and we will see. And I will say goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.